We're going to open God's Word now, and we're going to get to a psalm that's all about what we've been worshiping here tonight, all about the stillness of our souls and how we understand and can experience God. But I want to tell you a couple st- a story first. My first short-term mission experience as an adult was way back in the late 1970s when I traveled to Europe with a Christian basketball team. It was called News Release, and we traveled around Italy and the former Yugoslavia, just sharing the gospel in whatever way we could, but particularly through a sport. We'd draw crowds and share information and, and sing and so forth. Uh, but the organization's headquarters was in Geneva, Switzerland, of all places. So that's where we spent our first couple of days on the trip. And our accommodations there were quite unusual. We didn't stay in a youth hostel or a hotel. We stayed in a bomb shelter. Uh, I don't know really why. I think it was probably very cheap for the mission organization to get this bomb shelter. But we stayed in the bomb shelter. Cold War era, underground bomb shelter made out of concrete and steel. It was kind of like sleeping in a cave. A really dark, really quiet cave. Um, In fact, it was so dark uh, that when you woke up in the morning, you couldn't tell you were awake. Uh, There was no light whatsoever. So you could open your eyes, and I couldn't tell if my eyes were open or not. So you couldn't tell if you were awake. It was the weirdest thing. Kind of creepy, kind of fun all at the same time. Never slept so much my whole life. But evidently, the Swiss government began making those bomb shelters back during World War II, even though they weren't directly involved in the war, kept building them throughout the Cold War through the 60s and through the 70s. So even though Switzerland has never been directly involved in a war, they now have enough bomb shelters to accommodate their entire population. They have 300,000 bomb shelters in the country of Switzerland, enough for 8.6 million people or 114% of their citizenship. Tonight we're wrapping up our series called You Were Made for This, Growing in Worship. And as I said, we've used two definitions of worship for the last five weeks. One is worship is offering extravagant devotion to someone or something. Extravagant devotion. But the second we've celebrated already here, which is worship is responding to all that God is with all that we are. And today we're talking about worship as private devotion, worship that is personal to you and to me. We're going to read from Psalm 46 today, a great psalm, uh, one that uh, the great Martin Luther loved. And let me read it for you, or you you can look on your screens. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Selah. And that word is a Hebrew word that's uh, directed to the choirs. It means sort of a rest or musical interlude. Uh, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. First thing I want to say here is that God is our refuge. The psalmist is telling us God is refuge. Now, I think it was thinking of God as refuge that reminded me of the story of staying in the bomb shelter so many years ago. But then I did a little research and I discovered that the Swiss aren't the only ones to build bomb shelters. Did you know that right here in America today, thousands of families are purchasing and installing prefabricated underground bomb shelters every year. If you search for shelters or bomb shelters on the internet, you'll find dozens of providers, dozens of manufacturers, and they offer these shelters like this one on the screen. It looks like a sewer pipe with... uh, with pipes sticking out of it. Uh, this is on the cheaper side. But they offer these things that protect every, you from everything, from nuclear war to natural disaster, economic collapse, zombie apocalypse. That's what their, their, their websites actually say. And they range in price from 20,000 bucks to several million dollars, depending on size and amenities. And when I look at that, I kind of get it. You know, I understand in a way that, you know, some global catastrophe happens and you and your family can have a safe place to hide until you can come out of your bomb shelter. I get that, I guess. On the other hand, if something like that were to happen and you survived, uh, then what? 
You, just you and the zombies? You know, you, you go raid a 7-Eleven or something? What, what kind of life do you survive into? The writer of Psalm 46 is clear about where he finds his safety. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Now, the Hebrew word used here for refuge means a place of trust. It comes from a verb meaning to flee to or to take shelter in. Now, this psalm was most likely written in response to a great battle that Israel faced, likely against an enemy that seemed insurmountable at the time. And the psalm is teaching that God himself is our place of safety in times of trouble. A couple of weeks ago, just as I sat down with my Bible, with my notes to begin this message, I just sat down and my cell phone buzzed. I picked it up and the voice on the other end relayed news of a family that I know from our church family experiencing a very troubling time. The trouble wasn't an atomic bomb. It wasn't the attack of the zombies. It was something much more personal, much more close and real, much more devastating than all of that. When the ancient psalm writer faced trouble, he wrote, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. This text was written about a nation facing crisis, but I think we can apply the psalmist's words to our own more personal battles. Week after week, uh, our, our pastors, myself, Jeff, Bruce, Roger, all of us hear of people facing battles. Battles like cancer, depression, unemployment, bankruptcy, addiction, divorce, many, many more. Where do we turn when trouble strikes near? Scripture says, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The psalm is telling us that God is our refuge in at least two ways. First, notice the Lord Almighty is with us. I've learned over the years that one of the things that pain or trouble does is make us feel alone, even abandoned. It's almost universally true with people who are going through a difficult time. It's e and it's true either because those around us don't know what we're going through, therefore we feel alone, or they do know and they don't know what to do or to say. And they avoid us and they stay away, making us feel even more alone in our struggle. Notice the psalm says that God is present even though we face trouble. That he does not abandon us in our time of trouble. Rather, he is ever present. One who is close, who has been proven to help even in our trouble. Second, notice that scripture teaches that the God of Jacob is our fortress. Years ago, one of our boys had a, developed a little uh, routine around bedtime. We'd send him up to bed to wait to do all the brush, teeth brushing and stuff, get ready for bed. We'd come up and say prayers. And it was my turn. And but what, by the time I could send him up, brush teeth, and get up there, it, only two or three minutes. By the time I got to his room, he would have built a fortress around his bed of pillows and stuffed animals. Sometimes multiple pillows thick and high, and he would be hiding in there. And he would make me break through to get to him to say the goodnight prayer. It was just a little ritual we developed over a couple of years. He doesn't do that anymore, unfortunately. But fortresses are a little bit foreign to us in our culture. Uh, but for most of human history, fortresses were necessary for the survival of a people or a culture. A fortress is that which protects and provides safety from an enemy. I think the writer here is thinking more about spiritual safety than he is physical safety. God is the fortress of our hearts, he's saying. In Philippians chapter 4 in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, and that word it means like a sentinel standing in a tower, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul's teaching us that our fortress isn't made of concrete and steel. It's not buried underground somewhere. It's built out of prayer. Next, the psalm is teaching that we find refuge in God's promise of salvation. Notice these lines in the middle of the psalm. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. What's he talking about there? What rivers? 
Well, scholars believe there are probably two meanings to this verse. The river whose streams make glad the city of God is likely a reference either to the river Kidron that ran by Jerusalem or the waters of Shiloh, which branched off and ran through the city, supplying water to its inhabitants. See, in the ancient world, if there was a river running through the city, the city could survive a siege. It could survive any hardship because it had a source of water. And then in Revelation chapter 22, at the end of the Bible, we read, And the angel showed me, as John's looking into heaven, and the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. So the Bible is teaching us we find refuge in the fortress of prayer, and we are sustained by the waters of salvation. Secondly, in this psalm, we see that God is our strength. He's our refuge, and He's our strength. When my brother Joe and I were very young, we shared a bedroom, and our uh, mom and dad would take turns praying with us, just like we did with our kids. And one night, it was my dad's turn, and my brother and I uh, shared this memory of this one night. Of all the nights that we slept in the same room, <coughs> excuse me, we remember this one night in particular. And we've shared this story back and forth. Dad came in, prayed with us, and he went to leave. And as he went to leave, he stood in our doorway, and he turned out the light in our bedroom. But the light behind him in the hallway was still lit. So he stood there for a moment, silhouetted in the doorway of our room. And I can still remember, at age nine or whatever, he was in his uh, work dress pants, but he had taken off his dress shirt. He had just his T-shirt on. He was standing in the, in the doorway. And to us as little boys, he seemed to fill up that doorway. We were lying down, but somehow the angle, he just was filling up the whole doorway. And then it was just for a moment, he turned off the uh, hall light and was gone. And it was quiet in our bedroom for a few moments. And then I think I was the one who said, I, I, I whispered across the room to my little brother. I said, hey, did you see that? And he went, yeah, he's huge. <laughs> see, my dad was just an ordinary sized guy, maybe 5'10 in those days. He shrunk a little since then. Just an ordinary sized man. But to us as little boys, he was like a superhero. He was the biggest, most awesome man in the whole world. The biggest person we could ever imagine, the strongest. And the vision of him in the doorway reinforced our trust in his strength, and therefore we felt safe. The psalm writer focuses on the strength of the Lord. He says, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Two things we need to say about God's strength. First, God is stronger than our enemy. God is stronger than our enemy. I mentioned that Martin Luther loved this psalm. It said of Luther that when he heard any discouraging news, he would say, come, let us sing the 46th psalm. It actually served as an inspiration for his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which includes these words. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Lord Sabaoth, his name from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. See, Israel's enemies were nations like the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and their kings. But our enemies today are much more personal than that. Discouragement, doubt, fear, despair. Because we have an enemy, an enemy who desires our destruction, we need a refuge. Our enemy seeks to destroy our hearts, our faith, our hope, our joy. But the psalmist says, come and see what our Lord has done. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. 1 John 4 says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. God is stronger than our enemy. Secondly, it's also important to recognize God is also stronger than us. He's stronger than you. Years ago, I read a book about uh, family therapy that told the story of, of a nine-year-old boy who had demonstrated some just uh, strange, troubling behavior. I think he was lighting fires in wastebaskets at school. Just troubling. Parents were concerned, so they took him to see a therapist. And after a, a, a series of sessions, the therapist discovered quite by accident that this little boy sincerely believed he was physically stronger than his father. 
who was many years older and much, much bigger and outweighed him, was much, much stronger. But the boy believed he was stronger because the father was very passive. He had never felt his father's strength. And the fire setting was all about getting the attention of his father. He needed his father's discipline and strength in his life. So the therapist assigned the father um, a homework assignment. And it was to wrestle with his son every day for 10 minutes, but to be sure that he always wrestled his son to the ground and pinned him to the ground and won the match. The boy's behavior disappeared almost overnight because what he craved, what he needed to know was his father's strength. We see a similar story, a wonderful story in Genesis chapter 32 in the Old Testament, the story of Jacob. Let me just read it for you, this part of it. It says, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maid servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. The man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It's because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. So much in that ancient, strange story. But for our purposes tonight, you need to know that Jacob lived his life up to that point in his own strength, believing he was the strongest, he was the smartest, he was the shrewdest, and then he wrestled with God. And he knew, knew, found out he needed to surrender to the strength of God. And one of the things I've come to believe about that text is that it's kind of a picture of the way we experience prayer. I've sometimes described prayer as wrestling with God in the dark until you feel him wrestle back. Because I believe the Bible teaches us that God wants us to wrestle with him. He wants to wrestle with us. He wants us to feel and know his strength. He wants to bless us. But we need to know this. God is stronger than us. He's bigger than you. And if you wrestle with God, he will win. And after he wins, he will always bless. Always. The blessing of God comes after a struggle and after our surrender. God is our strength, the psalmist says. And thirdly, God is ever present. Ever present, the psalmist says. I've always personally uh, liked to pray either early in the morning or late at night. I just personally, once I get started in the day, I have trouble sensing God's presence. I get busy and so forth, but early in the morning, late at night. And many years ago, when I was in graduate school, before I was married, struggling with several big decisions of my life, I decided I, I really needed to pray. I needed God's guidance. I needed to experience it. I needed to hear something. So I intentionally walked out of my apartment all the way to a little small lake near the campus where I was living and climbed up in a lifeguard chair. It was like 11 o'clock at night, dark, in front of this lake, and just prayed. Poured out my heart, 30, 40 minutes, just asking God for direction, asking him for answers, just poured out my heart, and not much happened. Didn't really hear any direction, and I said amen and got down off the chair, maybe a tad bit disappointed, uh, because it seemed that God really wasn't anywhere near the lifeguard chair. As I turned away from the lifeguard chair, lakes out there, I turned around to walk back home to my apartment. I took about two steps and suddenly had the strangest sense, an overwhelming sense that someone had walked up right behind me. You know how you get that sense of someone comes up behind you is trying to scare you and you sense them before they say anything and you, and I whipped, I turned around. I thought someone was playing a trick on me. I turned around, my heart pounding and nobody was there. And I just looked out at the lake and then just in that instant, there was a, a, whis a whisper inside. And he just said, I'm always here. And I've always been here. And then just like that, the presence was gone. But I knew something I did not know before that moment. God is ever present, says the psalm writer. How? How do we experience him? How do we know his presence? Well, God is ever present in our worship. Last week, Jeff talked about our corporate praise. Scripture uh, teaches that God is present in the praise of his people. God is present in our troubles. Uh, the writer has just told us. And God is also present in our stillness. In our stillness. 
In 1 Kings, there's a beautiful story, well-known story of Elijah the prophet. He's hiding in a cave, terrified of people that are chasing him who want to kill him. And he's, uh, and he's just hiding in the cave, cowering. And he senses God's presence. Here's what the Bible says, 1 Kings chapter 19. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? The voice, of course, was the voice of God himself. And as we read on in the story, God encourages Elijah to continue his prophetic ministry and to quit hiding in the cave. And Elijah does that. God shows Elijah that his power and presence is manifested not only in a dramatic demonstration of earthquake or wind or fire, but also in a whisper. Elijah knew all about dramatic uh, demonstrations of God's power. He'd just seen fire fall from heaven and consume a sacrifice in front of false prophets. But what he needed at this point of his life was the reassurance of God's whisper. He needed to hear God's voice. And I think that's what the writer of the psalm is telling us in Psalm 46. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The Hebrew word translated be still carries the meaning of letting one's hands fall. It means to relax, to cease from striving, to rest. And I think that's a foreign concept in our culture. Stillness is difficult for us. Hard for most of us, hard for me. We live in a culture that relentlessly commits us to busyness and to noise and to activity. And most of us resist stillness with everything that we have because we fear it. And the result is we do not and we cannot hear the gentle whisper. God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our safety. And we can know him because he is present and because he speaks. God is always speaking, but he rarely shouts. He rarely shouts. He whispers. He whispers through his word. He whispers as we pray. He whispers through our worship. But we must be still enough to hear. We've been trying to give you worship challenges week by week, and here's your challenge as we close this series. Maybe it's time to set aside a little time with the TV off. Maybe it's time to put the cell phone, the iPad down, the constant flow of chatter and information. Put it away. Cease your striving for a bit. Cease your working, your doing, your busyness, your running, and just be still. Carve out some time each day this week. You'd su be surprised how long 10 minutes is if you're still. Carve out time. Find a quiet place. Let everything drop away on purpose. And just be still. And listen. Lord God, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for the refuge you provide. We thank you for your presence. Teach us to find our refuge in you. Teach us to be still and hear your gentle whisper. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.